Today we're going to take a look at viral host range. And in terms of viral host range, what I'm talking about is if viruses are supposed to attach to um, a host cell, how do they know what kind of a cell to get into? Because you hear about viral infections and you, you think that, you know, most viral infections don't multiply in multiple different species. So most viruses typically infect only a single species or even only certain cells within an organism. Okay, um, one good example, influenza, the flu, typically infects the respiratory cells of the nasopharynx. When you get the flu, that's where it stays. It resides in those epithelial cells in your nose and back of your throat. They don't travel throughout your body. They don't spread. They don't infect any other cells. Those are the ones that are targeted and attacked. So exactly how does that work? Well, there's a major limiting factor, right? The major limiting factor are those glycoproteins or the spikes that bind to the host cell proteins. And so these zoonotic diseases, those that attack animals, um, can multiply in sometimes widely divergent species. So one example is West Nile virus. We hear frequently about West Nile being in birds, being in mosquitoes, and then in humans. Okay, so what happens is sometimes there are genetic alterations in strains um, as a result of mutation, and those can result in increased virulence for the hosts as well as increased transmissibility between the hosts. So what does that mean for us? Well, what we know is that through the process of genetic reassortment, okay, there is alteration of the genetic properties of viruses as a result of two viruses entering the same cell. So, for example, influenza, we talked about its particular genome. It's got eight pieces of segmented RNA. So eight pieces means that it can be mutated fairly readily. Now, hemagglutinin is one of the glycoproteins that is responsible for the attachment to the human cells. So it might be changed when it's in another cell of a different species, for example, in a pig or in a duck. And so with avian influenza, this can create an entire new strain of influenza because the 16 RNA pieces commingle in between the human flu and the avian flu. So here's just a picture over here and we've got the hemagglutinin is one of the glycoproteins involved. Okay, neuraminidase you can see is another one, all right, but it's that hemagglutinin that is the one that's so incredibly variable. Now, in terms of genetic reassortment, there are two different types that can occur. One is called antigenic shift, in which there is a swapping of whole genes. So this explains how human influenza has changed, has changed like every 10 to 30 years and causes what we consider to be pandemics or worldwide outbreaks. The last one of these for human influenza occurred in 1918. And you may have studied it, you may have heard of it before the 1918 pandemic. But maybe you haven't, and the 1918 pandemic actually caused World War I to end because more people were dying of the flu than were actually being killed by the war. So many soldiers ended up dying because of the flu um, in those out camps. Antigenic drift is different in that there's just um, some point mutations that occur because of the bad proofreading when, the mess, or when that RNA gets made. So when you're making eight different segments of RNA, and then they all have to get packaged into those capsids during assembly, it, it happens so quickly. Sometimes there's mistakes made. Um, and so those individual little mistakes create just a little bit of a variation of that glycoprotein on the surface of the virus. So it's kind of like um, the teachers in our building, we all have keys. But the thing is, is my science key only works in a science room, right? Math teachers have math keys that only work to get into math rooms. So I can't, for example, go down to the social studies department and get into one of those classrooms because I don't have a social studies key. So it's just like that. 
viruses are very, very specific in that they go in and they try and attach to particular glycoproteins, lock and key fit, and if they fit, they can get in. Now, sometimes antigenic shift or antigenic drift enable them to access cells that they normally wouldn't be able to get into. So here's what I want you to remember. Shift is a whole gene. Drift, little tiny changes, okay? We're going to look more um, at genetic reassortment here um, in our assignment today and in the video that we're going to watch tomorrow. So the next thing I wanted to talk with you about are the other infectious agents. So these are agents which are even smaller than viruses and composed of even less. So remember that viruses are composed of protein and either DNA or RNA. So keep that in mind. Prions are named so because they are considered proteinaceous infectious particles. They are composed of only protein. Okay? They infect typically animals and humans. So the most common examples are mad cow disease and chronic wasting disease in deer. Um, they're known as the transmissible spongiform encephalopathies because what they do is these prions go in and they cause proteins um, in the nerve cells of the brain, in the neuron, to convert into these dysfunctional type of protein. So because those proteins don't work, those cells don't work, and they end up dying. Well, as a result, there, you end up with these sponge-like holes in the areas where the cells have died. So um, if, you, if you're a hunter, you know that when you go out to, to go hunting and you're watching for deer, the DNR has asked that all people report any signs of deer that they might find that, that exhibit the symptoms. They have kind of an uneasy gait. They can't really walk very well, almost like they're inebriated. Um, and then they drool a lot and they kind of look like their eyes don't focus very well. Um, and so those are the symptoms of, of deer that would have chronic wasting disease. Now, viroids are the other type of proteinaceous agent. They're composed of RNA only. They infect plants, um, and I've got typo in there. Um, they can cause what's known as cucumber pale fruit, because you know how cucumber has real dark green skin on it, but the inside is real light colored. Well, the cucumber pale fruit, the skin is actually the same color, light green. Um, and then potato spindle tuber, which is indicated here where there's a normal potato on the left, and the two next to it both have the potato spindle tuber viroid. So at this point, they only infect plants. Um, but personally, for me, with the, with the scariness of the um, transmission of possible prions from animals to humans, um, I would just be a little concerned that those viroids would be able to figure out a way to infect our cells. So for me, well, I'm not sure I'd eat the cucumber if I came across it and it had a pale skin. So exactly how do um, these proteins with prions work? The prion actually goes in, and we can see over here a blow-up right here um, of this particular area, so in the, in the cell body of the axon. And the prion protein converts those normal proteins into their prion type structure. So this impairs their function and causes the cell to die. So this is what creates those characteristic sponge-like holes in the brain tissue of the infected organisms. So all it is is just a simple conversion by contact. Um, that's as, as much as we know at this point. So we're going to take a look at um, how genetic reassortment and antigenic shift and drift can impact um, the host range of a virus.